Maxwell Street in Chicago was one of the most dynamic, eclectic, delicious shopping districts anywhere in the world. It was a capitalistic classroom, a cultural patchwork quilt, a congested teeming bazaar where a gold leaf valuable edition of Othello could be bought off a pushcart and a second-hand pair of long johns off a telephone pole. The center of commerce for most of the Jewish immigrants who came to Chicago from the late 19th century until after the Holocaust of World War II, Maxwell Street also drew African Americans from the South. They brought the blues to the everyday experience, exciting and enriching the atmosphere. You saw things on Maxwell Street you didn't see anywhere else. This man, Casey Jones, made a living for decades with a chicken on his head and a beat-up little stomach Steinway incessantly pumping out the same few scratchy tunes. A couple of Polaroid cameras and a billboard sombrero, and you were in business. On Maxwell Street, you could shop for chopped liver and then be mesmerized by Arvella Gray, a blind, two-fingered steel guitarist blues man. Some of the very best blues musicians performed on the crowded Maxwell Street sidewalks, in the alleys, and under porches. J.B. Hutto, Robert Nighthawk, Little Walter, and Johnny Young are but a few. You bargained on Maxwell Street. Smart shoppers and sellers learned the art of negotiation. You learned how to save. And you could be saved. If you needed to keep the devil away, Someone was on a nearby corner, Bible in hand, ready to quell the inferno. There were many preachers, absolutely certain that they had just the right message you needed. And gospel singers on Maxwell Street helped soothe the soul. There was always music, like the blues on another corner, certainly enhancing, freezing the moment. The Great Chicago Fire of 1871 didn't touch the Maxwell Street area. In fact, Maxwell Street thrived even more afterward. While most of Chicago was rising from the ashes, large numbers of Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe found Maxwell Street a ready locale for pursuit of the American dream. They brought their village lifestyle, the open markets, the kosher butcher shops, skilled jewelers and tailors. They built synagogues and Hebrew schools. Freedom and liberty, solid American ingredients, made opportunity the one commodity that never was out of stock for anyone on Maxwell Street. You just had to want it and work hard. In its halcyon days, the Maxwell Street area was about a mile square, encompassing many streets, with the intersection of Maxwell and Halstead Streets the heart of the district. From the first years of the 20th century until the mid-1970s, literally scores of thousands shopped Saturdays and Sundays whatever the weather. Weekdays were always busy too, with many buyers coming from the big loop office buildings to lunch on a hot dog and negotiate a deal on something. Roller skates, a pair of pants, a new fedora, a cure for your corns or calluses, or one of 10 wristwatches a guy had for sale on his arm. Many Orthodox Jews made the hard decision to work on the Saturday Sabbath because that's when most of the rest of Chicago and Indiana, Iowa, Wisconsin, wherever, came to experience Maxwell Street. Commerce was the center of Maxwell Street's more than century-long history. The blues, the street attractions, the distractions drew crowds, but it was the business, the lure of the bargain that stirred the pot. Not every business was Jewish owned. This is Paula Hernandez Delgadillo in her El Gardenia grocery in 1921. Italians had businesses, so did Irishmen and eventually Koreans, Indians, Chinese, even gypsies made a living operating on the street. Nate's delicatessen belonged to Nate Duncan, an African American who bought the place in the 1970s from his boss, Ben Lyon whose family operated the business as Lion's Delicatessen from the 1920s. Nate spoke Yiddish and kept the menu strictly kosher. He never worked anywhere else but on Maxwell Street. Every nook and cranny in the area was leased. Need shoes shined? Go to Maxwell Street. 
Need some fresh watermelons? Go to Maxwell Street. Always, somebody was trying to make a living. Somebody was looking to make a deal. But there was order on Maxwell Street. By law, after 1931, street vendors, like these from the Lerner Shoe Company, could operate from 6 in the morning until 7 at night. But if potential buyers were still around, somebody was still selling. For decades, the Maxwell Street area was called a ghetto. To its last days, it was often called, affectionately or not, Jewtown. As early as 1891, 16,000 people were estimated to be living on a mile-long stretch of Maxwell Street. Housing was overcrowded, streets unpaved, and sanitation problems common. In the early years, immigrants worked where they lived. The idea was to survive, to ensure their children's lives would be better, their futures brighter. But over the years, thousands of children worked when they were not in school or studying Torah. They learned their families' businesses. There was little time for play. When they could play, often it was at the nearby Chicago Hebrew Institute, later called the Jewish People's Institute. Many children worked in tailor shops. Early on, these were truly sweatshops with unsafe, unhealthy working conditions. At its height, there was anything and everything available in the Maxwell Street Market. You could buy new, the very best quality merchandise and negotiate on the price. Or you could buy rags, literally rags, and of course, negotiate the price. Here, a seller in 1906 mans his wagon load of rags. For years, rags, new rags, old rags, torn rags, anything called rags were a staple on Maxwell Street. The fabric was reprocessed. This tobacco store with its Hebrew signage featured Turkish cigarettes and cigars. There were several cigar makers around Maxwell Street. Congress Cigar, owned by the Paley family, made the La Polina brand. In 1928, William Paley and his father Sam purchased a struggling radio network to better advertise their La Polina cigars. The network was called CBS. If a customer wanted the freshest poultry, she could select a live chicken or goose from Maxwell Street kosher butchers like Joe Ross and Joe Brody. They'd slaughter and clean the birds while the customer waited. Sam Ackler and his son Israel were Maxwell Street area butchers also. Israel Ackler's route to the street included taking his brother Morris's name. Morris, a Russian soldier, had somehow obtained proper immigration papers, but was killed in World War I. Israel Ackler used those documents to enter the United States. If they lived long enough, some draftees in the Tsar's army faced 25 years of active service. Martin Carm's route to a Maxwell Street clothing store began when he purposely shot himself in the foot to avoid the possibility of 25 years in the Russian army. When that didn't work, he deserted. Throughout the shopping district, store owners employed what became known as pullers, whose job was to lure unsuspecting customers inside, deftly leading them to a salesman who could sell shoes to a mermaid. Making the sale was always the mantra on Maxwell Street. In the 1930s, Sam Robin helped his father run a second-hand bakery Later, selling clothing, Robin learned that if he sold a shirt, he should never let the customer out of the store without buying cufflinks, a tie, and then a tie clasp. There were true department stores in the Maxwell Street area. The Makovich department store operated for almost 75 years. There was a grocery, a furniture department, toys. Makovich even operated a credit company. If you bought a dining room set at Makovich, they gave you free a parrot and a birdcage. Mandolins to medicine balls were available on Maxwell Street. This stand belonged to Kay's Sporting Goods in 1939. Maybe all you wanted were hubcaps, but on Maxwell Street, you seldom shopped without eating. Food in the Maxwell Street area was famous. Like Lyons and Nate's Delis, Levitt's Delicatessen was noted for its corned beef sandwiches that were delivered to customers on a wire in overhead baskets. In later years, the Levitt site became a popular hot dog and Polish sausage spot called Jim's Original. Jim's never closed. You could find a red hot or Polish sausage stand with almost every turn of your head. The aroma of hot dogs and grilled onions could lure you to the street almost as much as the bargains and the blues. 
The famous Chicago-style hot dog can be traced back to the Vienna Sausage Company, founded in the Maxwell Street area by two Austrian immigrants over a century ago. You could always eat well and eat a lot on Maxwell Street. As the area aged and the Jewish presence lessened, other ethnic-style food, chicken wings, soul food, or just an icy snow cone were part of the bill of fare. Old Maxwell Street is gone, torn down and trucked away. But Maxwell Street's history, its meaning, its excitement, its inclusiveness is in Chicago's fabric, an unending societal DNA chain that preserves not only the memories, but the magnitude. anything for the house, here's an outdoor hardware store. Pretty gypsy girls, and some not so pretty, but all dressed in their colorful garb, will try to sell you anything, and how they can chisel. 
Chicago owes much of its success and fortune to the heterogeneous mixture that feeds its great melting pot. Maxwell Street on Sunday, where the handcart peddlers bargain with crowds of customers, comprises Chicago's outdoor mercantile melting pot. Here, one can buy just about everything from a darning needle to a second-hand fur coat at negotiated cash and carry prices. And this is Free, a film made by Mike Shea, Howard Auk, and this gentleman, Gordon Quinn. Gordon, how long have you been a filmmaker? Well, over 30 years, and my first real job here in Chicago was working on This is Free with Mike Shea. He was just getting into film, and I was a student at the University of Chicago. You made this film very early in your career, you and Howard Auk and Mike Shea. When you look at it today, does it hold up for you? Do you still think it's a good film? Yeah, I really feel it holds up, you know, I mean, it's the, the street was so vibrant at that time and there was such a mix of all these different people and the excitement down there and really what drew us down there was the music. Uh, and originally we thought it was just going to be about music and then we saw everybody kind of had a music down there. There's the kid with his box and there's the people with their pitches and there's the religious pitch men and you know, it's all about a sound and a feel and a way of moving. And so that's really what drew us down there. Yeah, the only thing you didn't capture, and we haven't gotten to that technology yet, is the smells of the street, which yeah. were also wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Although, and uh, I did once work on a smell o vision project you many did? years ago, yeah. We won't talk about that. Okay. The, uh, the no narrator style that was it, Mike probably decided to go with that, that's remindful of, um, of the work of Fred Wiseman. Did that predate Wiseman, or was he influenced well, by, by, him? by No, it, it predated Wiseman by quite a bit. And w we were influenced by Ricky Leacock and direct cinema, Al Mazels, these people who were really inventing the early cinema verite filmmakers. And it was very important to Mike. Uh, you really picked up on something. He absolutely wanted no narrator. And also, he was very purist in his style, you know. Uh, didn't want to interfere with anybody, just observe. Never, like, you know, ask anybody to walk differently or that kind of thing. Well, you, you all captured the very spontaneous feel of the street. It's almost as if we were walking down there and just looking around without a camera over our shoulder. And I wonder, how did you get people to, 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 be, um, to ignore the camera, as they seem to have done? Well, you know, I think nowadays we're all pretty used to doing that. We see a lot of te on television of people very intimate moments and that kind of thing. And in those days, people weren't quite so used to it. But we were down there 16 Sundays in a row. It was very cold. We became a part of the street. You know, everybody wait, 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 knew you, us. You were there 16 Sundays 16 shooting? How much Sundays, film did you shoot? I can't remember, to be honest, but an enormous amount of film. Mike had one of the very first, he, the first, crystal-controlled, you know, so there was no wire between the camera and the sound man. I was completely free to move around, and he was free, and it was all handled by crystals. And he had the very first one in Chicago, and this was this technology that later Frederick Wiseman used, and Ricky Leacock and the Maisels brothers are the ones who sort of developed it in this country. Now, the sound, Gordon, is really, the whole picture is, is, is marvelous to see and hear, but the sound is very, very good for being shot in so many different places. Did you do a lot of setting up, or was that all done post-production, where you just changed levels? and? How'd you do it? We, we did all the sound live as it was happening. The big music groups uh, where you see Jimmy Brewer and Franny Brewers, you know, having their church service and the blues musicians when they're in the big groups was recorded by Norman Dayron. And we would go in and we would mic things individually, you know, because they're static and they're set in one place. But all the rest of the sound was done mostly with the old Electra Voice 642 and Anagra. The scene of Fanny Brewer singing I Shall Overcome, yes. you know, where the, I'm really proud of the sound there because the sound of the street and her music, I'm mixing it right on the street with one mic, just by mic placement. And, you know, that's, that's the way we did it then. I understand that, uh, that Mike Shea uh, died not too long ago. We lost Mike. Mike was still working at 70. He was on a meatloaf uh, video out in L.A. where he lives now and was shooting and the helicopter went down. And, you know, he was a... He was a great contributor to young people coming into the business. He trained a lot of people in Chicago. I really learned to do camera work from Mike and a lot of other people, and he was just a great influence on the Chicago filmmaking scene. And then he went out to Los Angeles and began shooting feature films out there. The film that you three made is all the more remarkable now, uh, and more valuable now, I should say, because the Maxwell Street market no longer exists, at least not in that place or in that form. It has moved, however, and it's, it's a lot smaller, but uh, would you ever consider making a film of the new market? 
Probably not. Um, you know, we've been making films in Chicago for 30 years, but I mean, the new market is a, a shadow of its, its former self. I'd like to see him move it back to the old location. I gather some people are really campaigning for that. You know, it, what was so great about the market was it was this organic thing. It just would spring up, you know, on Saturday morning, uh, Sunday morning, and there were all these different people, all these different cultural things, and the market had its own culture and its own way of doing business and conducting things. And I think it was, you know, it was just a very vibrant part. It's what makes Chicago a great city, that it's a very sort of dynamic, alive, you know, a lot of synergies between different kinds of things and people. It's, it is it is uniquely Chicago, the film, and thank you very much for uh, some years after the fact to the three of you uh, for, for giving us a, a certain place and a certain time that will never be recreated and that we can see now, we can get a feel for it, we can remember, and those who've never seen it will have an opportunity to know what it was like. Where did you get your pretty little shoes, woman? Your dress so fine. Got your shoes off of Maxwell. I got your dress on the Austin. Oh, oh, I got your dress on the Austin. Your John Henry.